by Count Asta. My Lords, um, the Government have so far rejected uh, the opportunity to pause and wait until the Davis report is published in 2015 on airport capacity in the South of England and are pressing ahead with HS2. So we may have a new railway line on the right side of the country, but equally we could have a railway line on the wrong side of the country, but who knows? But HS2 is going ahead. What we do know is that the Department have rejected a route stopping at Heathrow and so far have rejected a spur that would connect to Heathrow Airport. So we are faced with the possibility that Heathrow may end up with the worst rail connection of any major airport in Europe. Now the House of Commons um, Transport Select Committee in their recent report <coughs> called for a third runway at Heathrow and rejected the idea of a new airport in the Thames Estuary and called for HS2 to directly serve Heathrow. I wonder what the Minister's response is to this report. I imagine, of course, that he, they will, the government will want to wait until the Davis report has, uh, ha, has been published. So today we have to deal with the route that is proposed by the government for HS2. Now, if it cannot cross the Chilterns at its narrow, their narrowest point, it must be tunnelled where possible or mitigating measures put in place so to give maximum environmental protection. And if the government would accept this one principle, one it accepted for HS1, that for any areas of outstanding national beauty, the route should be tunnelled, opposition to HS2 and the Chilterns would largely disappear. Another help would be to add an intermediate station, perhaps at Vista, so at least those living in the area could benefit from HS2. I think it's worth repeating what made HS1 acceptable, what became known as the Kent Principles. Any route should be tunnelled or engineered with cuttings and sound barriers to minimise sound intrusion. It must follow the shortest route for areas of outstanding national beauty. There must be an advantage for locals and intermediate station, as uh, like Ashford was created for HS1. And any route should follow, where possible, noisy transport corridors such as existing motorways. HS2 achieves none of these for one very simple reason, speed. And I'll come back to that, my lords, in a moment. The urgent issue that really concerns me is compensation. The judicial review judgment found that the government must review their proposals. Now, if you live within 60 metres of the line, you are entitled automatically to compensation. But, my lords, if I could put it this way, if you could imagine HS2 crossing the middle of the Prince's Chamber and your house was on the first crossbench, you'd get compensation. But if your house was on the third crossbench, you get nothing, and I would submit that that is not a very large difference. We do know that at least one house that is 450 metres away from the proposed line has been valued as worthless by the local building society. Many with homes just outside the plan route have found their value has plummeted and they cannot sell at any price. The mortgage company is demanding repayment due to the loan falling below the value of the house, and of course the banks are not interested in helping. One example, a couple in their late 70s, they lived a few metres beyond the 60 metre limit. Their house was worth well over 200,000, now virtually worthless. They cannot afford to sell, but they can't afford to stay. They want to move into a care home, but they can't because theoretically they'd have to pay as their assets are, are worth more than the 70,000. They don't have the money, they don't have a way out. They don't meet the definition of hardship and will only be able to make an application for compensation to the land tribunal after 15 years based on the physical nuisance on complex rules. So if they've not been gathered by then, they certainly won't be able to afford the cost of the case, so they do suffer a terrible vicious circle, and I think this is some issue that the government really ought to consider. So far, three quarters of those who have applied to sell their homes to HS2 have been turned down under the government's exceptional hardship scheme. So the government should, I believe, review the terms of the scheme. A property bond has been proposed that would allow homeowners to, homeowners to apply to the government for an undertaking to purchase the property at a future date if the buyer cannot be found at the unblighted price. The bond would be transferable with the property so to give confidence and security to any future purchaser or mortgage lender. This is not a new scheme. This type of scheme has been operated by Central Railways as well as by British Airports Authority, as it were, who had a similar scheme, and mortgage lenders have successfully 
work with the scheme. What the government should remember is it's not just the effect of the trains once the line is completed. It's the many years of construction, the noise, the dust in the summer, and the hundreds of heavy lorries using country, county lane, country lanes. Local businesses too are affected, and under the scheme they're going to have to prove loss of business, but only after some years. It would be a rather depressing thought to see the value of your local business decline in front of you when you're unable to do anything about it until it's too late. Now we know that HS2 is going to cost over 32 billion for the track, another 8 billion for the trains, that's over 40 billion in all. So can we have a little fairness for those who suffer real hardship? Will the government consider a property bond? And I did give my noble friend, the minister, notice that I was going to ask him this question. As I said earlier, it does come back to speed. The faster you go, the straighter the track has to be. No corners, so no flexibility. The government have designed the track so that trains can run 400 kilometres per hour, which would make them some of the fastest in Europe. They plan to start at 360 kilometres per hour and work up with an average speed to be achieved from London to Birmingham of 330 kilometres an hour. Now, HS1's maximum operating speed is 225 kilometres an hour, with an average speed from London to the Channel Tunnel of 211 kilometres an hour. So that average speed shows that the service will have to operate at much slower speeds through tunnels and, and urban areas for HS2. Of the 225 kilometre lengths of HS2's route from London to Birmingham, less than half, 109 kilometres, is capable of the planned 400 uh, kilometres an hour speed due to various constraints. So we have to ask, why design a track that will enable trains to run at this high speed of 400 kilometres an hour, when we know it takes time to build up speed, as much time to break to slow the speed, both using energy and increasing CO2 emissions. The problem with, with a projected speed of this nature is that it, there can be no corners. The track virtually has to run in a straight line. The minimum radius of curvature for the track increases, I'm told, and I'm no mathematician, I have to say, or indeed expert on this, from 4.05 kilometres to 7.2 kilometres. And what's more, it then limits the length of tunnels that we can travel at speed. So it has to be straight. It cannot avoid urban areas or the unspoilt valleys of the Chilterns or follow the M line of the M40 where possible to Birmingham. What we do know, looking at Europe, is that train speeds are being reduced, not increased, due to the disproportional effect of very high speed on train and track maintenance and on energy consumption and efficiency. If HS2 was planned to operate at the same top speed as HS1, all the main issues could be dealt with, including a station at Vista linking through to the Midlands, which would give it local support. By following by far as possible the M40 to minimise environmental impacts, it would avoid most of the scarring destruction and damage to many homes. Many less houses than the current plan would be affected, and that would be a saving of costs, and that would uh, enable the government to actually save money, even though it would then have to have a few more uh, 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 longer length of, of track. Uh, it would avoid the loss of ancient monuments, woodlands, the severance of many public rights of way. So my plea is for the government to look and see what can be done. It's not too late. We know when it came to HS1 that there was a debate right up until the moment it was built on where the track should go. It's not impossible to make changes. We know that we have an enabling bill coming before us in this session of Parliament, and we know that we, the government hope to introduce a full bill um, during also the, in, in perhaps next year. So it's not too late to review the route, to take in all the matters that affect the route, whether it's speed, environmental benefits, the environmental impact. But I would urge that if the government wants to produce a route, and I quite understand if they're determined to go ahead that they should do so, that they should look at the effect on those who li live along the route and see what they can do to mitigate the damage and also improve the compensation that is available. My Lord, I congratulate the Noble Viscount for this debate. Um, it's timely and he's raised some interesting points. Um, 
Certainly on the compensation issue, I think he's got a very good point. And when I worked on the Channel Tunnel, which was an Anglo-French project, we were struck by the difference in compensation regimes between the two countries. I think in France you get, um, <coughs> that you get the, um, the valuation of the property plus 10% plus your moving costs. And it was remarkable that very few people complained there, whereas they did in, they did in, um, in, in, the, in England, um, and they continue to. And um, <coughs> given the extra time and hassle it takes, there's, and the unfairness that the noble lord mentioned, I think there's a strong argument for improving the package. Um, he mentioned uh, the link to Heathrow. Um, I believe in this, in, in a new line to get extra capacity on the railway between London and the West Midlands and North West and North East. Um, whether it's a high speed passenger or an ordinary passenger or freight, I declare an interest as chairman of the Rail Freight Group, but either way you need more capacity. Um, and uh, because the traffic is forecast to double in the next 20 years and the existing line certainly can't do it. Um, the government's chosen the high-speed line. Um, I personally don't have too much problem with most of the route um, and it's interesting that actually the route is still subject to change as we've seen. Um, I don't think a spur to Heathrow has, is, is particularly sensible because I mean, passengers going to Heathrow are terribly important, I'm sure, um, but in terms of the volume compared to the passengers going to central London, they're very small. And they probably only justify, say, for Manchester one train an hour, whereas there's probably going to be three or four going to central London. And they're not going to get to their terminal <coughs> without changing trains because there's three groups of terminals at Heathrow, so they're going to have to change anyway, so they might as well change at Old Oak Common. That's my simplistic view on it. But I think where I worry about the present situation is that we're getting more and more tunnels. We've um, got a new one next to East Midland Airport, which I think is very good for the logistics industry. We've got another one near Ryslip, which I'm sure my noble friend Lord Russell will be pleased about. Um, and we've got lots of tunnels uh, or extra lengths through the Chilterns, um, uh, where um, <coughs> There may be more to come, there may be not, but um, the extra cost of these tunnels is probably well over a billion now. It may be more than that. Now, I've got two issues with the tunnels. Uh, uh, Noble, Lord, Noble Viscount said that it slowed the trains down. Well, it does, unless you build a tunnel big enough to reduce the air pressure, and it, 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 therefore that costs more. So there's a balance there. I'm, I haven't got a clue what the right balance is, but <coughs> he makes some good points. However, I question really whether you need quite so many tunnels because there are not that many tunnels in Kent actually. If you go down and look at the line there, I, I spent quite a lot of time working with it on the, out, on the side of the, the, the line when it was being built and um, there was enormous opposition at the time um, and the environmental protection was pretty good, I thought. There are some tunnels, um, sort of fake tunnels and there's a real tunnel through the through the hills, but um, <coughs> you don't find many people there who now say what a disaster it is. They live with it, they're quite happy with it, um, and basically sort of say what all the fuss is about. Because um, having been brought up in a nice little village called Great Missenden, um, the one thing I didn't like was the road that goes between Aylesbury and Amersham, which even 40 or 50 or 60 years ago was a pretty horrible road with lots of traffic. and. Frankly, building a, a, <coughs> a high-speed railway beside it, it's pretty straight, um, with the right sound barriers, um, I would have thought was probably just as um, good or bad as building a, a long, long tunnel, but that's, that's just happened to be my opinion. But I think the main issue for me is that if there's going to be change, and if one's going to consider all these things, um, Many noble lords have and probably will talk about the, um, the, the destruction, alleged destruction in the Chilton and elsewhere. I don't know how many houses are going to be affected along the route outside London, but in, in the Camden area <coughs> there's probably 400 houses there which are going to be affected by the proposed demolition 
west of Euston Station and up at um, uh, Camden Road. And they are just as they have just as much right to being considered and looked after as the people who live in leafier areas. Um, Lord Bradshaw and I have come up with an alternative scheme for the London end of the High Speed 2, which, uh, uh, which avoids those two areas of demolition, and instead it, the idea is to construct an underground station, sort of linking Euston and um, St Pancras underground, next door to where Crossrail 2 might go, which is, gives you a much better um, uh, passenger throughput to the two stations, but also allows a proper connection to HS1, um, which would provide not only for international trains, as such as they may be, but also a sort of new east-west Thames link, if one likes, which would probably get very popular. And there's new forecasts coming out quite soon, which I think will support that. So <coughs> I hope, I'd like to ask the Noble Lord when he responds to say whether he's got any views on this Euston Cross proposal. We have met HS2, we've met some ministers. Um, we've got further work to do because HS2 say it's too expensive, but I mean they would, wouldn't they? But if, they, if they're going to add one and a half billion for tunnels, um, they should at least look at, look at this scheme to see if it's, the same, if it's the same price or even a little bit more and it's got more cost benefit, um, <coughs> it should be investigated. Um, I personally hope that this scheme does go ahead with some changes um, because if it doesn't um, then we're going to start the whole process all over again but uh, I do hope that HS2 will, will, will engage with more people, more groups, more individuals along the route and listen to some of the, some of the comments that they're getting otherwise they're going to find a very large number of petitions waiting for them when they get to the House of Commons Select Committee and the House of Lords one, which will cost them a lot of time and a lot of money. My Lords, I add my congratulations to my noble friend for bringing this matter before the House again. There are many issues surrounding this expensive, grandiose, in my eyes, not needed venture. But first, may I declare my interest in this subject, as HS2 slices right through the magnificent farmland and the rural communities of the constituency where I live. Not only are we blighted by this, but also by the threat and horror of wind turbines, the M40 runs through the constituency, so altogether we feel that we have been singled out for a battering this seems to me to be the industrialization of our beautiful countryside. People's lives are being ruined as they assess their plight, and I feel particularly concerned for those who would apparently not be compensated as they live very close, but then not close enough to benefit from compensation. If this venture is to proceed, it seems very strange that the government did not choose to build the line in the corridor of the M1 and the Birmingham to London railway line. The cost would, I believe, be less as the blight has already been established and the links around Birmingham <coughs> and Birmingham International could be addressed much more simply than the present hand plans reveal. The business case for this project seems to be very flimsy and it is difficult to find reliable figures in support. I heard on Radio 4 last week that the benefit-cost ratio has been reduced from 2.4 to 1.6, and it is inconceivable that the cost of the project, £33 billion, will increase. All public projects do. We are told that HS2 will deliver 100,000 new jobs sometime in the future, but the business case was, as Margaret Hodge said, clearly not up to scratch. It is very difficult to accept the situation. There seems to be no evidence from the Department for Transport to claim that HS2 would deliver regional economic growth. It just seems to be an ambitious fantasy pipe dream which will be constructed at an unaffordable cost to the taxpayer. Since the privatisation of the railways, I marvel at the transformation 
of rail services. My nearest station is Banbury, so I can travel to London on the Chiltern Line. We have new trains, all fitted with Wi-Fi, enabling passengers able to work on their computers in the comfort of carpeted carriages. Travel time is not, certainly not seen as a waste of time, but a quiet time away from phones before the start and the hurly-burly of the day. The journey of 55 minutes arriving at Maribyrn on time is impressive, and it seems to me that we travel at high enough speeds now. I try not to travel at high peak times, but if seats are in short supply then, as many others have said, longer platforms to accommodate longer trains would be the answer. This would involve developing the infrastructure, so bringing much needed employment to all parts of the country now and not in the years to come. I do not know how many would profit from HS2, but it would be the few compared with the many that would benefit from the upgrading of all stations on the commuter routes. There is much work to do on the business plan before the project could be approved. And most importantly, a great deal of research is needed considering the environmental damage that would be caused. My Lords, we should never forget we are the custodians of our precious countryside. And so for the sake of all, we must not destroy our rural communities and the treasured way of life that is our heritage. My Lords, I declare an interest as uh, the current preferred route for phase one of HS2 goes very close to my home in Little Missenden. Uh, close enough to blight it, in the words used by the noble Baroness Seacombe but certainly not close enough to qualify for any compensation. I would like to thank the noble Lord Astor for securing this debate and indeed for his valiant work altogether in keeping this uh, issue in the public eye. I agree with everything he said about the compensation scheme, which I think needs to be completely reworked, uh, perhaps along the French model mentioned by my noble friend Lord Barclay. And I uh, also thought that his points about the way in which the route for HS1 uh, was changed quite late in the day were ones that we might want to keep in our minds as we move towards the paving bill and then the hybrid bill. Uh, like, like the noble lord, I have no objection to HS2 in principle, and I support my party's position on the introduction of this technology. However, taking a fresh look at HS2 might well help the government, and indeed future governments, to build in greater connectivity, more sustainability, and important flexibility, and it would also help in meeting local concerns without damaging the overall national objectives of the project. My Lords, in their announcement of the preferred route for HS2 Phase 2, the Government said that the scheme has been designed to minimise potential impacts on settlements and properties, as well as important environmental and heritage sites. It goes on to say that the route avoids national parks, AONBs and registered parks and gardens. So can the Noble Lord the Minister, Earl Attlee, who is also Viscount Prestwood, say why this approach was not taken for Phase 1, which currently destroys the AONB in the Chilterns, including it should be noted, the village of Prestwood. Indeed, the Chilterns AONB is now the only AONB along the entire HS2 Phase 1 and Phase 2 route that is adversely impacted by the proposed project. Although the route is tunnelled from the M25 for approximately 13 kilometres through to Hyde Heath, potentially, partially bypassing Little Missenden, the remainder of the route through the AONB to beyond Wendover is on the surface or in cuttings of various steps. This has had a major and unacceptable impact on areas of ancient woodland a scheduled ancient monument, several rights of way and ancient highways and damaging impacts on the landscape and tranquility of a nationally protected area. Local residents, the county council and the local district councils along with the conservation bodies believe that if the current route has to be retained, the only acceptable solution is a tunnel throughout the AONB continuing on from Little Missenden under Mantles Wood to Wendover. This would ensure that the villages of Presswood, Great Missenden, Hyde Heath and Wendover were given full tunnel protection as well as the beautiful and unspoiled countryside in which they are located. I agree with the noble Viscount Astor when he said that the government needs to think harder about the environmental impacts and to learn the lessons from what made <coughs> HS, HS1 acceptable, what he, what he described as the Kent principles, which should be applied to the Chilterns A, O, and B. In addition to protect, better protecting the environment and unique natural assets, redrawing the preferred phase one route would further enable the government to meet the local concerns without damaging the overall objectives of the entire project. 
My Lords, the draft HS2 environmental statement consultation, which was published on 16th May, accepts that a tunnel all through the Chilterns AONB would perform better on environmental grounds compared with the current proposal. It also accepts that the all through tunnel option is feasible in engineering terms, would reduce operational noise impacts, would save landscaping costs, and would mitigate major surface construction at 10 locations within the AONB, including ancient woodlands and the Grimm's Ditch scheduled ancient monument. The Woodland Trust recognises the potential benefits of using tunnels throughout this section of the Chiltern ONB, particularly because it can negate the loss of the ancient woodlands. Perhaps the Noble Order Minister can explain how he can justify his department's approach when DEFRA's recent forestry policy statement states England's 340,000 hectares of ancient woodlands are exceptionally rich in wildlife, including many rare species and habitats. They're an integral part of England's cultural heritage and act as reservoirs from which wildlife can spread into new woodlands. It states categorically that protection of our trees, woods and forests, especially our ancient woodland, is our top priority. Top priority, my lords. We understand that the Department of Transport are drawing up a landscape plan for HS2 which proposes the planting of 4 million native trees. These new trees, although welcome, can never compensate for the loss of ancient woodlands, which by its very nature is irreplaceable. My lords, the government needs to explain why the HS1 Kent principles are not being applied to HS2 Phase 1, and in particular why the preferred route does not follow the existing transport corridors away from the Chilterns AONV. And the need to get a better balance between the irretrievable loss of a unique natural landscape against shaving a few minutes off a journey. I'd be grateful if the Noble Order Minister could confirm that a plan to tunnel all through the Chilterns AONV will be included in the final environmental statement report as one of the main alternatives that HS2 Limited has studied so that the public and in due course Parliament can take this information into account at the hybrid bill stage. Redrawing the phase one route so that it crosses the Chilterns A, O and B at a narrower point would help to meet local concerns without damaging the overall national objectives of the HS2 project and it would also, by the way, improve rail access to Heathrow. Given the extent to which this might enable local people to come more readily to accept the HS2 project, it would seem an eminently sensible proposal. It must make sense for the government to bring as many people along with its plans as it can. And of course, if it could be agreed, it would also reduce considerably the time required for scrutiny of the hybrid bill, which was referred to by my noble friend. I urge the government to look again at the preferred route for phase one of HS2. And also, first of all, I'd like to apologize for arriving late. I was given slightly different uh, timings, but obviously the error was clearly mine, and I'll reread Hansard uh, carefully to uh, take note of what's been said. Uh, my Lords, I too would like to thank the Noble Viscount Lord Astor for, for initiating this short debate. This is the third such debate since last summer, and no doubt there will be many more over the coming years. The, compensing, the compensation scheme still appears shambolic to me, with many thousands of people losing out, trapped in homes they may be unable to sell. I hope the Noble Earl, the Minister, will reassure your Lordships uh, that the government is finally getting a grip of the situation. And perhaps he could also inform your Lordships if the government finds favour with a property bond. Since our last debate in February, there have been further developments. The National Audit Office's report on HS2 is damning. The case for HS2 is not convincing and the timetable was, quote, challenging. The NAO said it is unclear how the project would deliver and rebalance economic growth, particularly in the regions. The Department for Transport had not assessed the value of time savings correctly and had knowingly used outdated data. There was a £3.3 <coughs> billion pound funding gap and the DFT had simply got its cost-benefit ratio figures wrong. The head of the NAO summed it up thus. It is too early in the HS2 program to, con con to conclude on the likelihood of its achieving value for money. Our concern at this point is the lack of clarity around the department's objectives. The response of the Secretary of State for Transport in the other place to the NAO report quite frankly sounds to me as if he's losing the plot. He attacked the NAO as a bunch of bean counters. Now, Quite apart from the extraordinary spectacle of a cabinet minister attacking a body set up by parliament to hold government to account, I would question why the Secretary of State for Transport has more faith in his own officials whose planning and implementation to date has not been above reproach. In fact, on occasion, it's been quite awful. 
Then, my lords, there is the question of the draft environmental statement, which is very disappointing. The government's own forestry policy statement, as is referred to by the uh, noble Lord Stevenson of Balmakara, uh, states that protection of our trees, woods and forests, especially our ancient woodland, is our top priority. Yet, the draft summary of the environmental statement says, at present, there are no root-wide significant effects on habitats. That is patently not the case, my lords. Nor will growing an extra four million trees, as has already been mentioned, replace the irreplaceable. That is an environmental sop. In fact, the proposed design speed of HS2 at 400 kilometers per hour, resulting in a virtually straight line between London and Birmingham, will inflict maximum damage on the environment, including the Chilterns area of outstanding natural beauty. The Chilterns <coughs> ARNB is now the only one along the entire route so affected. A lower design speed following existing transport cor corridors as of HS1 would have a far reduced impact. Uh, along the lines of the Kent principles referred to by the uh, noble Viscount Lord Astor and Lord Stevenson of Balmakara. My Lords, uh, in conclusion, I hope that the Government will listen carefully to reasoned opposition on HS2 and not descend into a mindless tactic of attacking the messenger rather than addressing the serious issues raised. Uh, Lord Vincent, I do apologise for arriving late to this meeting, but the uh, overrun rather threw the timetable out. Um, I hadn't scheduled to speak, but um, as a businessman and having followed the debates on the whole of HS2 quite clearly, it does seem to me still a folly of the first order. Our country is desperate for new infrastructure development, not only in railways, but particularly in roads and elsewhere. To pick a project that won't begin to return any money for 15 years because it can't till it's running, a product that's been undoubtedly underestimated already and already left out the cost of the trains, which are very much an integral part of the project in the first place, which should be added, to spend 30 to 40 billion pounds on something that will yield, when it does, a negative return because there is no high-speed train railway in the world that runs at a profit, which will have very high fares to try and justify it or be heavily subsidised, one or the other. What this country needs is that 40 billion pounds spent now, over the next 10 years, on improving our road bottlenecks, where 95% of our freight will always travel, because freight can't go by high-speed trains. It's a fantasy to think it can. Where we have bottlenecks on the existing railways, which could be pinch points, which could be opened out for a fraction of the money here. I'm only repeating many of the hugely sensible arguments that have been put up against this vanity project. I hope it can be delayed in every possible way. I hope the Treasury will come to the conclusion that it's far too expensive. I hope sanity will reign so that this money we can redeflect it or deflect it onto national products that really will give an economic return. Roads, for example, give a huge economic return. And it's no good saying, oh, they're all people who've got to travel by train. They will travel by car to reach the high-speed train, and there'll be massive congestion, congestion around the new terminals that uh, this train is uh, going to put in place. It's a fantasy project. Nowhere in the world do high-speed trains pay, as I say. Um, we've got very short distances in this country, and the longest distance to Edinburgh will always be able to offer fares by air at a quarter of the price that of fares by train, for the simple reason that airs, air travel has no highway costs. It has terminal costs, but no highway costs. That's what makes air travel inherently cheap over longer distances. So, my lords, on all these factors, I hope the government will reconsider and find a good, <coughs> good excuse for dodging the, um, their present plans and find there's an admirable reason for postponing and then delaying and then cancelling this fantasy project which will bring no benefit, economic benefit, at all to the British Isles. Uh, my Lords, I too would like to uh, thank the Noble Lord Viscount Astor for uh, enabling us to have uh, this debate uh, today. Um, it's probably uh, not an unfair statement to make that most of the speeches we've heard have hardly been enthusiastic about HS2, and I'll return to that point uh, shortly. 
Um, first of all, on the question of alternative routes, I hope the Noble Lord, the Minister, will be able to say something about the extent to which the current route now proposed is or is not fixed, and in particular, the extent to which any further changes would or would not involve reopening or extending the consultation process and the impact this might have on the timetable for the development and construction of the line. And perhaps the Noble Lord, the Minister, could also say whether further decisions to put more of the line in a tunnel or cutting than is presently envisaged would or would not mean further delay as a result. Now, I ask these questions also in the context of a press advertisement this morning from the Department for Transport about public consultation events on the draft environmental statement for phase one of HS2. Is the basis of this consultation that the route, including the extent to which it is in tunnel or above ground, has been fixed or could this consultation lead to changes in the route or the extent to which it is in a tunnel or a cutting? On compensation terms, I await with interest to hear the Noble Lord, the Minister's response to the questions raised and points made in the debate today. Uh, will the amount of money available for compensation be fixed or is the government saying it can be increased if the government decides a case for doing so has been made? And what action has the government taken in the light of the recent judicial decision on compensation? Um, reference has already been made to the recent National Audit Office report on High Speed 2. And it's clear that the government's inability to progress major transport projects properly uh, continues. Having already announced it would be incapable of making a decision during the entire five years of this parliament on airport capacity in the southeast, the government then showed itself less than capable of running the rail franchise bidding programme. The West Coast mainline franchising fiasco has resulted in nearly the whole of the rest of the programme being delayed or deferred and millions of pounds of taxpayers' money wasted. Now the next display of a deficiency in competence over handling a project is occurring over the high-speed rail link from London to the West Midlands, Manchester and Leeds. A less than complimentary National Audit Office report has highlighted financial and timetabling problems as well as the government's failure to articulate properly the powerful case for HS2. As a result, the current hostility, as we have seen in part today, of a number of primarily Conservative MPs and peers to the project is continuing. The National Audit Office has damningly said that the government's strategic reasons for developing High Speed 2 were not well presented in the business case. And their report also states that the timetable for introducing the hybrid bill for HS2 Phase 1 to Parliament this year has been over-ambitious and still remains challenging. Witheringly, for transport ministers, the NAO then drew attention to their earlier report on cancelling the, the Intercity West Coast franchise procurement, which had highlighted the mistakes that can be made in trying to meet an unrealistic timetable. Further issues of concern to the NAO are the absence of a government mechanism to agree long-term, in principle, funding for the life of the HS2 programme and serious doubts over the Transport Department's capacity to undertake the HS2 programme to a challenging timetable, bearing in mind its other commitments and the impact of considerable organisational change driven by the government within the department. The NAO report doesn't address the environmental case for HS2, for reasons, frankly, that are not clear, but then calls for an examination of premium fares for HS2 when there's no precedent for it, as the HS1 premium fares only apply to commuter services and no commuter services are planned for HS2. Our support for HS2, which we first proposed and embarked upon when in government, remains undiminished. It's needed to address serious and mounting capacity problems on our existing rail network and in particular the West Coast Main Line. The NAO report spells out far more effectively than this government has ever done the increasing capacity problems for commuters at Euston in the peak and goes on to say that, and I quote, a new line, IHS2, would release capacity for extra commuting services as most intercity services would transfer. As we said before, in the light of the government's decision on the route their dithering and delay on the question of airport capacity in the southeast and the need to progress HS HS2, we are no longer pressing for our preferred alternative route via Heathrow. We do still have serious concerns about the adequacy of the link proposed in London between HS2 and the high-speed one route to the Channel Tunnel and Europe, 
the impact of the government's plans on Camden and also recent proposals for a scaled back Euston station. We will, though, be providing cross-party support to secure the parliamentary approval for the HS2 project to become a reality, whilst ensuring that it's fully integrated into the existing network, is affordable to use, and not undertaken at the expense of investment in the existing network. However, HS2 will not progress if the government again fails to get its act together on this further major transport project. The larger government party have lost control and influence over their backbenchers on Europe and on gay marriage in both the Commons and the Lords. If a hat-trick of backbench rebellions is to be avoided, the government has to make the case for HS2 with rather more vigour and determination than it has up to now, and also act on the critical NAO report on their failures to date. Well, my lords, I can assure the committee that I will be supporting and pursuing the HS2 uh, uh, project with great vigour. Uh, my lords, may I start by thanking my noble friend Viscount Astor um, for securing this evening's debate and also other noble lords for their contributions. A project as significant as HS2 deserves plenty of time to debate and I am happy to try to address your lordship's questions this evening and I hope on future occasions. There have been some developments. My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Transport, introduced the High Speed Rail Preparation Bill into the House of Commons on the 13th of May, which my noble friend uh, referred to. This is uh, colloquially known as the Paving Bill. We also published a draft environmental statement for Phase 1 on the 16th of May, along with a consultation on the proposed route refinements. Noble Lords will also be aware of the NAO's review of HS2. The report is a snapshot from the past and the project has moved on. Economic modelling is just part of the story. If we only relied on modelling, we would not have built the M1, the parts of the M25 or the Jubilee Line extension to Canary Wharf. We are not building HS2 simply because the computer says yes. It is right to think to make Britain a stronger and more prosperous place. Now, the Noble Lord Lord Rosser made much of the NAO report. Um, perhaps I might remind the Noble Lord that the government is running with a project that his party started, and we are very happy to run with that project, because this is a transformational project which will serve eight out of ten of the UK's largest cities, bringing our major cities to closer together and two-thirds of the people in the north to within two hours of London. My Lords, the Government supports a direct high-speed connection to Heathrow, but it is sensible that further work on a link to Heathrow should await the consideration of the Airport Commission's recommendations due in 2015. If it fits with the Commission's recommendations, we could consult separately later and include a spur in the legislation for Phase 2. It could be constructed as part of Phase 2 without any impact on the operational railway. Um, my Lords, we welcome the outcome of the judicial review with nine out of the ten challenges being rejected. The one challenge that the judge found against the government, on, on, the government concerned the 2011 consultation on property compensation rights. The judgment makes clear that it was the process and not the actual compensation scheme itself that was flawed. We are giving detailed consideration to the judge's comments and are planning to reconsult later this year on property compensation schemes. My noble friend has claimed that the properties more than 60 metres from the line would not be eligible for compensation. This is not correct. The EHS for phase one has no defined geographical limit for qualification, but the EHS, the exceptional hardship scheme, is only the start we will consult later this year on long-term proposals for property schemes which apply to those outside the 120 metre swathe that my noble friend has described and I have more to say on, on, on property compensation. My Lord, it is regrettable that the recent judicial review has delayed the introduction of further compensation. However, the government has been clear that we want to get compensation to those who need it as quickly as possible. While inappropriate to speculate on the final package of schemes, I can confirm that the scheme 
the consultation will include a property bond. Um, the government is determined to make this an environmentally responsible scheme and has listened to concerns and worked closely with Natural England and the Environment Agency. But you cannot build a railway without causing some disruption. The noble Lord Lord Stevenson of Balmacara um, raised the issue of the Chilterns following the 2011 consultation. Of the 13 miles of route through the Chiltern uh, AONB, less than two miles will be at or above the surface. This is more than a 50% increase in tunnel or green tunnel than the original route. In terms of avoiding the AONB, it is clearly harder to achieve this uh, near the home counties uh, rather than further north where there's, there's more possibilities of, of changing the route. Well, mitigation can have its own impacts. A, f a full board tunnel through the Chilterns was considered but would require 10 ventilation shafts as well as an emergency access station. This would be a box constructed within the AONB around half a mile long with good road access for emergency services. Only one feasible location for this access station was identified, close to Little Missenden on the A413, requiring the box to be between 40 and 50 metres deep, making this a costly and significant engineering challenge with its own environmental impacts. I'm grateful to the Noble Lord for giving way. I think um, I, I detected a, a somewhat uh, aggressive stance on what he was saying. I, I'm sorry about it that he says that. Does he not accept that there, were in there is, in fact, another alternative scheme, which has, I mentioned in my speech, for which there is a uh, proposal to put a, a relief tunnel exactly as specified and required under, under European legislation at Wendover Dean, and, doesn't, and that has the support of all local residents and is one of the <coughs> major reasons why that has been put forward. To say that there is no alternative except in Mantle's Wood, the very wood which is the ancient woodland of which we are carrying most concern, it does indeed happen to be near Little Missenden and indeed Great Missenden, then obviously uh, you know, we, do, we are against that. But there is an alternative there. It's not the best alternative. And I think it's, it's disingenuous of him to say that there were no other possible alternatives. My Lord, I'm extremely sorry to the committee if I appear to be aggressive. I have no intention of doing that at all. However, the noble Lord is raising detailed points about the route, um, and my duty is to defend the whole scheme. It will be the duty of Parliament to finally approve the route. At the moment, we are consulting about the route, um, and we need to do that, that, that properly. Um, and, of course, I will read Hensard carefully to look at the precise points um, that the noble Lord has made. Um, my Lord, turning to the issue of train speeds, my noble friend Lord Astor has raised the issue of train speed. The route has been engineered to allow for train speeds up to 400 km per hour in the future, should there be a commercial justification for doing so. Operation at up to 400 km per hour would require consideration of whether improved train design enables services to operate at that higher speed without additional significant adverse environmental effects. Going fast does not disproportionately increase the cost of the infrastructure, but it does mean that the alignment has to be more or less straight. Now, my lords, I will try to, as hard as I can, to answer as many questions as I can in the remaining time. Uh, my noble friend Lord Astor proposed a station at Vista, but then he went on to point out the difficulties of accelerating and decelerating from stations. Um, my noble friend also um, further comments on train speed, whilst it's true that some European operators are looking at operating at slightly lower speeds, largely due to maintenance issues, we are not aware of any planning to go as low as 225 kilometres per hour. The infrastructure is still built for higher speeds, so when technology allows, they would be able to return to those higher operating speeds. Now, my noble friend also talked about the, the spur to Heathrow. It's important to understand that the spur has not been cancelled, it has been paused, and it is too early to predict the outcome of the airport's commission work or any decisions taken following that. There are no plans to slow down the progress on phase one. We need to press on quickly with phase one so we can deliver the economic and wider benefits that higher rail speed can bring. Um, my Lords, um, does pausing the spur mean no third runway at Heathrow? The government's position on the third runway at Heathrow remains unchanged, as set out in the coalition agreement. 
However, the Airports Commission has been tasked with identifying and recommending to government options for maintaining the UK status as an international hub for aviation. Uh, my noble friend Lord Astor and others have suggested that the route should, where possible, follow noisy transport corridors such as in, uh, existing motorways. During the course of the scheme development work in 2009, six main corridors, including the M40 and M1, were considered. The routes were rejected primarily because of their adverse implications for journey times and economic benefits, which were compounded by their higher costs. Any environmental advantages that these options offered over the proposed scheme were marginal at best and therefore not decisive, decisive in discounting these routes. Um, my Lords, um, turning now to the, the issue of compensation, we are clear that we need to have a very good compensation scheme. Most infrastructure projects only compensate property owners at a much later stage of development when statutory measures apply. For the HS2 project, an exceptional hardship scheme has already been introduced while the route is being considered. Subject to consultation later this year, the government has already stated that it hopes to introduce subsequent schemes going even further than the law requires in order to ensure fair compensation for those directly affected by uh, HS2. Perhaps, my lords, it may be helpful if I gave, gave a case study for what we're doing with EHS. But it, remembering that it's inappropriate for me to comment on specific individual cases. My lords, take a lady living 350 metres from the proposed HS2 route who suffered from an illness that meant, which meant she was unable to safely climb the stairs in her home. The lady therefore needed to sell her home in order to purchase a bungalow, but because of the proximity of HS2, she was unable to s achieve a sale, price, a sale at the required price. The lady and her husband applied to the EHS, providing documentary evidence that they met the criteria for the scheme, including that the lady was suffering exceptional hardship. A majority independent panel considered the evidence and recommended that the lady's home should be purchased from her. This recommendation was agreed, reviewed and agreed by a senior civil servant at the DFT. Twelve weeks later, we exchanged contracts on the lady's home for the full on blighted value. We have so far bought 81 properties onto the scheme, suspending just on, spending just under £50 million and offered, have offered to buy a further 32. My, my, my noble friend, giving women. Um, he very kindly um, uh, said that he would, uh, the government did have the intention of introducing a property bond. I realise that there won't be time for him to go into the details of it today, but I'd be very grateful when he's had a chance to consider what it might be if you would perhaps write to those of you who spoke in this debate with any details that he has. My Lord, I very nearly did slip up in what I said. Um, I said that. I nearly said that we would be introducing a property bond, but I corrected myself and said that we would be consulting on a property bond, which is rather different. Uh, my Lords, um, the, my noble friend also uh, um, gave us an, an amusing analogy about the, the, the Palace of Westminster um, uh, and where the cross benches are and everything. My Lords, this claim reflects neither the current statutory provisions nor the discretionary proposals put forth by the government. Property owners may be entitled to Part 1 compensation under the Land Compensation Act 1973. This is paid if a property loses value due to the impact of physical factors arising from the use of new infrastructure, such as noise, dust and vibration. This is available for owner-occupiers of residential properties, small businesses and agriculture units. Owners can put in claims once the railway line has been open for a year and this allows the actual impact of the infrastructure to be understood. Now, my lords, I have completely run out of money, uh, of time. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I will have to, to, to write uh, uh, on all the other things, apart from the noble Lord Lord Barclay's suggestion ab about um, the, uh, um, the underground station, the, uh, the below ground station at Euston. The Noble Lord, I've, I've read the Noble Lord's proposal uh, uh, very carefully, um, but I'm afraid it has been rejected. In order to avoid underground lines, the proposed Crossrail 2 and Thameslink station at Cross, King's Cross, 
the station would need to be very deep, 50 metres plus. The significant additional cost and complexity of constructing such a station and the significant safety issues it would present in respect of evacuation means that this option is not viable. And I have discussed it with the engineer. I'd happily uh, discuss it further with the noble lord if, if that would help. I would also be very happy to have separate meetings with noble lords on each individual issue because I only have 12 minutes to respond. It is very, very difficult for me to do justice uh, to noble lords' points. Um, in conclusion, I would like to reassure the committee that the government will continue to keep listening to concerns about the impact of HS2. The consultation on the draft environmental statement and route refinement will be an opportunity for people to respond with their views on what is needed. HS2 is about helping Britain to thrive and prosper. It's down. In light of what he's just said at the end about the consultation on the environmental statement, um, I'm still not clear, and I would therefore like him to confirm, could the outcome of that consultation lead to the route that has been determined so far being changed, and could the outcome of that consultation lead to the extent to which the line is in tunnel, is in a cutting, or is on the surface, to that also being changed, or is that all fixed now? My Lords, at the end of the day, nothing is fixed until Parliament uh, has determined what the route will be. The role of government is to propose to Parliament, using the appropriate procedures, what the route should be, and then uh, Parliament will agree what the route will be.